Good afternoon and welcome to the first lecture in the Department of Studio Art Spring Lecture Series. I'm Gerald Otten and I direct the Studio Art Exhibition Program. Before we begin, I'd like to ask you to turn off your cell phones, uh, laptops, every electronic device that you have that could interfere with our speaker today. Thanks. It's a pleasure to introduce to you today our spring artist in residence, the sculptor Elizabeth King. She was born in Ann Arbor, Michigan and received her BFA and MFA from the San Francisco Art Institute. She then taught for 10 years at Berkeley, followed by several teaching appointments at UC Davis, the City College of San Francisco, and the College of William and Mary. In 1985, she joined the faculty of Virginia Commonwealth University, the graduate sculpture program of which was again ranked this year number one in the country by US News and World Report, where she was appointed School of the Arts Research Professor in the Department of Sculpture and Extended Media in 1999. She's exhibited her work wi widely in solo and group exhibitions. Uh, solo exhibition venues include the Hanson Fuller Gallery in San Francisco, Nancy Drysdale Gallery in Washington, Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard, and Kent Gallery in New York. Group exhibition venues, and there are pages of them, uh, some of the uh, ones I've found were really interesting were the Invitational Exhibition of Painting and Sculpture at the American Academy of Arts and Letters, Beyond Real Surrealist Photography and Sculpture from Bay Area Collections at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, A Shriek from an Invisible Box at the Mugaro Museum in Tokyo, Black Maria Film Festival, The Legacy of the Short Film at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, her work has been featured or reviewed in all the top publications, including Art in America, Modern Painters, Aesthetics, Art Forum, The New York Times, and The Washington Post. In addition to numerous private and corporate collections, King's work is held in the permanent collections of the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the Muse Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. The exhibition in the Jaffe Freedy Gallery is a selection of work from a traveling retrospective entitled Elizabeth King, The Sizes of Things in the Mind's Eye. Nancy Prinsenthal begins the catalog essay, The Physiognomist of Wonder, by saying, quote, as with a deeply compelling novel, from the first glimpse of Elizabeth King's work, you know you've entered a world complete, realized in every smallest detail with utter assurance dazzling in its complexity. And at first, you are a little at a loss for all of its power, of its coherence and plenitude. It is an unfamiliar place, and you've entered in media race." Unquote. I encourage our students to get to know Elizabeth while she is here. If you're interested, come to the exhibition's office to set up an appointment, or Blitz, Blitz Nance Silliman, uh, and please join us for a reception directly following this talk in the Jaffe Freedy Gallery. And please join me in a warm welcome for Elizabeth King. Thank you. Thank you for coming. And Jerry, thank you for having me here. And Nance Silliman, thank you for buying delicious food and putting it in my apartment so when I arrived it was there and John Crane couldn't have put the show up without him and people have been just lovely here. John Lee built some things for us and so I feel very welcome here. Um, and I, I, the show that, that's at the, ja how's that pronounced? Jaffe Freedy? Freedy is kind of an experiment, uh, something that I've not done before. It's built all around a single sculpture, and it includes that sculpture and studies for that sculpture, other castings from the mold cycle from which that piece was made, um, film animations of it, and installations of it in using the film animation in with some optical um, a few optical tricks. So it's all built as sort of a single slice, like a sample extracted out of, out of um, the larger show, The Sizes of Things in the Mind's Eye, that's, that's currently on tour. 
I don't know what I think of it. Um, I thought I'd continue the experiment by starting my talk reading an excerpt from the essay that, that I'm writing for the catalog that we're going to do for the show here at Dartmouth. And, and then I'll, I'll um, show slides of a few earlier pieces and a few animations. So that said, we can start. We can lower the lights. I don't have a title for the catalog yet, though I was thinking of a wonderful um, malapropism from, from the great um, composer and inventor Theremin, who invented the musical instrument, the Theremin. He was groping around one day, trying to remember the Russian phrase for Ministry of the Interior, and said, the Ministry of Inside Things. So maybe that's the title here. I love this diagram from a book by Daniel Dennett. The brain can't talk to itself except out the mouth and back in the ear. Attention goes outside the body and comes back in to make thought. Definitely an arrow goes out through the hands into clay or paint, then back in through the eye. Can I get you thinking about the inside of a small, hollow thing in the shape of a head? This is my subject, the inside of the head, the mystery of what goes on in there. Somewhere in there is us. We are inside looking out. This piece I call by ear for the possibility of making a portrait of hearing. If you stand in just the right place, you can even look through one ear and out the other. You can look up the nose and just see the backs of the glass eyes. And this piece is in the show here at Dartmouth. I am modeling in clay the inside of the nostril and wonder, where is the line between outside, the outside of the head and the inside? Once I'm all the way in, a different representational order takes over. It would feel indirect, not to say presumptuous, to do this with anyone else's nose but my own. A self-portrait as a kind of telephone call from inside to out. A portrait, not so much of a person, but of a verb, an action taking place or being done, in this case, looking. When the abject, the unimmaculate flesh, took hold in the art of the 1980s, it felt as if there was a sudden explosion of things art hadn't yet said about the alive body. The miracle is that there is a center of emotional life within our bloody and corpuscular organism. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made, Psalm 139 says. My father passed away this year, and at his memorial service, my famous cousin, Carol Chickering, stood before us and sang for him. Bach's St. John Passion, Rachmaninoff's Vocalese, and at the end of the service, the Latin hymn, In Paradisum. Her voice articulated a grief we might not have been able to access or bear on our own, and then set us down gently so that we might not be damaged. Nothing between her and the world except her voice. Could I ever, clumsy sculptor, make something as bright and crystalline as that voice? Sculpture, too, has its timbre, pitch, and color. I can't think if I have nothing in my hands. Drawing. I draw a thing first if I can't possess it any other way then sculpture makes it all the more real. Portraits of my mother, because I couldn't have her any other way, her half a body, legs paralyzed from polio, particular materials for each kind of tissue, porcelain, glass, pear wood. But later, why a self-portrait? What is a self? We can't ever see ourselves as a whole thing. So many of us on this earth, each with a dead father, it's hard to square the pain of my one person's emotion against the sheer numbers of us out there, across continents, each one weeping in the shower. The sovereignty of the individual, 
the very word individual, meaning undividable. What is a self? It can only be unmade by violence. When a suicide bomber blows himself up, fragments of his body are driven by force into, inside the bodies of those near him. Survivors develop internal pocket infections. If we must use the term post-human, let's limit it to this unmaking of a self. But post-individual, this is a more useful term to describe our world now. Where is the solitary viewer nowadays, the dreaming viewer, the solitary reader? Now it's markets, constituencies, interest groups, voting blocks, etc. But the ideal audience for a card trick is an audience of one. What is a self? What we really need is a diagram where the arrow goes out one person's mouth and into another person's ear, and out their mouth and back into the first person's ear. So that's what I have so far. Let me know what you think later. I want to jump back to my student years. I'm just going to show a couple pieces. Luckily, there isn't a whole lot of it, you know, so you, you won't be here all night looking at my life's work. Um, it's, a, it's a high labor, low bulk ratio of, um, I made this piece in graduate school. To, it took two years to make, partly because it, it, it fell apart halfway through and I had to start over again. But it's, this is a little miniature room that fits around your head. And it splits open into two halves that are hinged to a chair. So I expected my viewer to sit in the chair and close this little theater around their head. My teachers wouldn't do it. In fact, my most favorite teacher was so claustrophobic that he wondered why I didn't you know, put it on top of a ladder and make him climb the ladder to put his head in a box. But inside the little theater, there's, you know, there's a chair, there's various you know, there's speakers hidden in the walls, and, and there's a tiny little faint soundtrack, Glenn Miller and Tex Beneke singing Gal from Kalamazoo. <laughs> and then on stage, a little closet door will open after about 40 seconds, so a lot of people got out before the, before the play started. Um, but the door opens by itself, and inside the closet is a little rubber puppet rigged up so that it's a little made out of latex and it's rigged up so she chews and looks at you through a mirror on the wall. I still have this piece. The rubber's getting a little old. Um, you know how rubber bands go bad. So she's gotten older since I made her. Um, and you know, so that, that was a, a piece, that was sort of my, my masterpiece in graduate school. And in the years following that piece, I made a number of other theater-like objects that were meant to be experienced by a single viewer at a time. But then gradually it was the puppet that I was most interested in, and so slowly started to work more and more exclusively figuratively, a little larger. This piece, which is now lost, uh, was about 24 inches high, and I wanted to make the joints more credibly movable, um, going beyond a puppet-like joint, though this is marionette-like into making something that would be capable of more complicated movement. And so this foot, which is about an inch long, was my first bronze casting. And then the toes are soldered and, and sort of wired together, so there's a little toe movement there. It looks, looks kind of prosthetic, but it turned out pretty well. It's one of those pieces where I'd stop to learn something and then go back to work on it. So I had, by the end of the sculpture, I had a piece that was a record of my you know, my blundering first attempts to weld and to solder and to cast. And then by the time I got to the feet, I'd really gotten good. That's why I'm showing you the foot here and not. <laughs> then another figure that came after that, um, this one was a portrait of my grandmother. And um, I really did intend to completely finish it. I, I even made some little some little stuffed sewn packages that I was going to sort of 
stitch onto her arms and you know make some clothes for her and my dream was to have this figure standing before me and I would be able to put it in different poses um, it's pretty it's pretty movable the spine moves all the all the joints move the eyes are movable but it takes a bit of doing to, to pose it some of the joints that need to sustain some leverage require a couple of screwdrivers or allen wrenches but I was definitely on my way towards towards the work that's really kind of occupied my best attention since then which which is a sculpture that is that carries with it aspects of of the history of, of figurative sculpture and then at the very same time is an attempt to without spoiling or too much damaging the emotional impact of the sculpture to joint it so it's movable posable you could say robotic though maybe that isn't quite the word either it's 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 a it's a fight between the image and the object if i make it really movable then the piece disintegrates into just a machine but if i compromise in the other direction then then it's just a statue and for some reason i love this fight i love the accidents that happen from the fight and it's a fight that's kind of been going on now for for many many years Here's the hands of that piece, the foot. This foot is maybe in, I don't know, about an inch and a half long, carved out of um, poplar. I got a little better at the bronze casting, so I made the spin-off piece, which is an articulated torso. All the pieces, almost all the pieces are half life size by linear measure, so this this is about half the height of your rib cage. I started to learn to make eyes. I met someone who was an ocularist in San Francisco whose family had made artificial human eyes for three generations. And after work, he kindly taught me how to do artificial eyes with dentral acrylic, with a two-part acrylic. So these are the first eyes I made, tiny, littler than marbles. And then um, that piece that I just showed you had, you can't really see it very well, but had a little later pair of eyes that I made for it from the acrylic, the two-part acrylic. This is a portrait of my mother from the side. Again, half-life size. That's low-fired porcelain. Here's a self-portrait, also low-fired porcelain with glass eyes. the bronze casting of it. That shoe that we looked at a minute ago, I was living in New York at the time, and, and, and if Arjun is in the audience, he'll, he'll know that, that why it is that I fell in love with old, old antique jointed wooden mannequins. And there were a couple of antique stores in the city that had some busted mannequins in the window, and I'd walk past them all the time and dream about getting my hands on one and posing it and seeing how, taking it apart and seeing how it was made. So I was working on this shoe at the time. So I took it, I took it into the store with me, into one of the stores, Howard Kaplan Antiques, used to be down on Broadway. And I held it up to Howard. I said, I could fix your mannequins. And he said, as only a New Yorker would, OK. So I walked out with one. And, and then for, for the next few years, repaired and restored antique wooden mannequins for a number of different dealers in the city. And um, I worked on these two for, for Varjans and my mutual friend, Herb Schinderman. And they later appeared in this Brooks Brothers suit ad in the New York Times men's fashion supplement, right, which I was paging through one day and came upon this ad and just had had a, a, a just a just a, a cascade of of maternal pride seeing these two things. <laughs> <laughs> that little one is a really really good one, and um, I have a few images of it later. This is an arm I made for a French fashion mannequin of a. Um, um, a young a young man, and the fashion mannequins had jointed wooden arms, but often paper mache bodies and maybe wax heads or maybe finial heads, and I drew it. Cl clearly, a case of drawing these things because I couldn't have them, so drawing them to have them that way. 
how are they made. Um, I, some of them I took apart in my studio to see what the internal ball and socket joints were like. So that little mannequin in the Brooks Brothers ad, that's the inside of its neck there on the right. It's a ball within a ball held in place by wooden pegs so the neck can rotate in its socket in all directions. So this was just a little sketch I made. I was going to adapt that for the wrist of a hand that I would work on. Working on these mannequins was a real turning point because wood on wood, a joint that is wood on wood with the friction that comes from wood, was much stronger and much lighter than the metal joints I'd been making. So starting then, and here's, here's a great picture of that mannequin with, with, with the clipping next to it. This was in a show at the Kent Gallery a couple years ago. And to the left, you can see there's a suite of drawings that I made of it. Herb lent it to me for the show. It was fantastic to see it again. So shortly after starting to, to repair the mannequins, I, I started to apply some of that technology to my own work. And so here's the first wooden piece that I made. This is carved holly. And the arms are about 13 inches long, again, half life size by linear measure. And I used that neck joint from the from the New York mannequin to make a, a, a nice revolving wrist joint for these hands. This is a close up. Gosh, now these things are everywhere. These jointed figures are back in style and they're just sort of mass producing them in the art supply stores. What none of them can do yet anyway and what I like to sort of feel proprietary about is the thumb joint. And, and the opposable thumb there is sort of a compromise. I've sliced up a big chunk of the palm of the hand and then buried a tiny little brass ball and socket joint at the base of the thumb. So in extreme extensions, <coughs> it can sort of start to look a little mechanical. But in many, many other extensions, you accept it. You accept the gestalt of the hand. And so these hands can do more po posing than the old fashioned hands could. This is a later set of hands that, that go to a figure that came many years later. Here's another shot. And, you know, the hand is about two, three inches, two and a half, three inches. You could just see that little tiny brass ball and socket joint, which is spring-loaded inside the, the wood, so I can tension it for just the right tension so that, I mean, the pleasure of this is, I mean, not only do they have to look good, but they have to act in your hands as would a nicely made instrument so that you lay your hands on this thing and you change its pose and it, and it moves easily in your hands. It's, you don't have to push it. It's a lot of the joints are spring-loaded so that they're just the right tension. The wrist definitely spring-loaded so you can tilt the hand in all the poses. This is a good picture for scale, the scale of the works. This is a piece called Pupil. The body is a carved Swiss pear, and then the head is porcelain and gla gla movable glass eyes. Oh, you like that little door, huh? <laughs> Everybody wants to know what that door is. The sculpture is filled with bonuses. You know, I had to, <laughs> I had to, um, I had to. That ball and socket joint at the waist has some real leverage on it, and wood being wood something that moves around with the seasons. I needed to build a little break on it, a little plunger that would let me adjust the tension on that joint so that so the piece would, would sustain its own weight. So I hid it behind that door. So if you open the door, it's very anticlimactic. There's just a little screw there that you tighten with a screwdriver. But with the door shut, anything could be in there. And <laughs> you know, and the great thing about the door is that it, it kind of gets you in there. And I like that. <laughs> Here's some paper cutouts that I made to design the joints. How would they be? How would the neck be? How would I have the shoulders rotate? Um, how would the elbow work? How would the rotating lower arm work? How would I design the wrist? Here's that piece in a cabinet. Here's the inside of its head. So the eyes are held in place with little spring-loaded rings. And you can reach in through the back of the head and move the eyes from right to left or up and down. 
eyes. This is my beginning, the beginnings of my eye collection back in, in the 1980s. And um, the, the best, most fabulous eye in the collection was given to me by Walter Danz, the young ocularist who first taught me how to make acrylic eyes. And this was a broken eye made by his grandfather. Um, and it's just a little, it's a little, it's a little painting in glass, you know, all those little threads and the iris and little tiny flecks of color and then the veins and the white of the eye, the pupil and the, 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 uh, the limbus, the little ring around the iris, just a beautiful work of art. Here's my collection now, it's getting bigger. Doll <coughs> hospitals, taxidermy shops, you know, flea markets, wherever I find them. And then sometimes I use them in the sculptures, but really I just think they're beautiful and collect them. Years later, I met um, another ocularist in Newark, New Jersey, who was still blowing glass eyes. Earl Schreiber is his name. And um, actually, Jerry, I forgot we should start the video. I, th I knew there was something I forgot. Can you see? Oh, not that video, Kiara. Not the big one. We're still doing slides. <laughs> this little video. Um, Earl Schreiber, who's since passed away, but who was one of the last ocularists in the US who made eyes in glass, the old-fashioned glass eye. Um, and Earl, because he wanted to teach his daughter how to do it, and because I was really eager to learn, we would have Saturday classes. I'd dry take the train in from New York. And the three of us would blow glass all day on Saturday. And Earl had a partner, Anthony, who didn't know we were doing this. He would have been furious. He would have felt that it was a betrayal of, of you know, a code of propriety that goes back through the world of glass and glass-made objects going back generations. But somebody had to learn how to carry it on. So Earl was willing to teach me. And we had these wonderful sessions. And at the same time, I was still making the eyes out of acrylic. So the eye up on the big screen is, is an eye that Earl and I made together. And this one is a human size eye. And it's, um, I made, I carved some, some lids for it out of holly and spring. I wanted to see if I could make an eye that would move independently of its eyelids. And then I built a little ball and socket interior so that it could rotate around its stand. And the eye itself was made by Earl in all of his wonderful skill. Um, later, I made an animation with that eye and, and made a small installation called Quizzing Glass, where I paired the actual eye with, with its occasionally blinking animation. The eye is really an amazing thing. Here's a few photographs taken by the great Swedish philosopher Leonard Nilsson in a book called Behold Man. These are all pictures taken of living tissue. And you know, the iris is a sphincter. And uh, nobody talks about this. You know, the word sphincter has gotten really a bad reputation. <laughs> you know, a lot of sphincters in the body, and this one is a really spectacular one. And um, here's, the, here's, a, here's the eye from the side showing you the cornea. I don't know if Joe Rosen is in the audience, but I was told that if you damage your cornea, your body will grow some blood vessels into it to repair it. And then when it's all repaired, the blood vessels will kind of drift away and disappear. So it's living tissue that's completely transparent. You can see the odd backside of the cornea here between it and the pupil. And then this is the lens of the eye. This is behind the pupil, um, inside the eye, but towards the front. And those, those big purple stalagmites there are part of the ciliary muscle, another sphincter that rings the lens of the eye. And then those little tiny, fine, fine little threads that you can just see there between the muscle and the lens are called the zonules of zen. And the zonules are an incredible tissue. When the eye 
wants to look at distant things, the muscle, the ciliary muscle contracts, and the zonules go taut, and they pull that onion-like lens. They pull it into a thinner, more lentil-like shape to diffract the light for distant viewing. And then if you want to look at something close up, you tighten that ciliary muscle. It tightens, and the zonules then go slack, and the lens then rebounds into a thicker onion to reflect, refract the light for seeing things close up. And I always wondered how your eye knew to do that. Like your mind, you know, you look at your fingertip and then you look at the door a couple hundred feet away. And how does your eye know to make that adjustment? I really think, you know, the Leo Steinberg wrote a wonderful essay called The Eye is a Part of the Mind. And in fact, the retina really, the retina cells are neurons. So the brain does come right on out there. Here's a great picture taken inside the eye looking out. I don't know how they did it. I don't know if there was a skylight in the operating room. They were probably doing a cataract sur removal surgery, which is done laterally through the side sometimes. Um, but this is the back of the iris looking out through the pupil. You can see Earl has now blown a, a sphere on the end of his pipette, blowing, spinning, blowing, spinning, blowing, spinning. And then he'll slowly, when I first saw it done, I thought it was such a miracle that these, all these different colors and irises and pupil colors centered themselves so magically. And then I learned later that this was a matter of huge skill, getting, getting it centered, just like a potter on a potter's wheel. It takes a great deal of practice to get the pupil right in the middle, to get the iris right in the middle blowing, while blowing, spinning, blowing, spinning. So right about this time with the sculpture, I, I, I've gotten to the point where I've gotten a piece that's really pretty adjustable and can do many different things. And I started taking photographs of it in different poses. This is the piece pupil that we saw a moment ago. And these photographs formed the basis of a book that, um, that I wrote called Attention's Loop, A Sculptor's Reverie on the Coexistence of Substance and Spirit. And there's a copy of that book in the gallery. And you'll see these pictures in it. Each page is a picture of the piece in one or another pose with accompanying text. And I started to dream about doing some kind of film animation. I'd learned about the films of the Brothers Quay, extraordinary film, Street of Crocodiles, and wondered if mm, I could somehow try and animate my own sculptures, though, you know, up until that point, it wasn't really film animation that I told myself I was headed for. I, I wasn't really thinking about it. To me, at that time, the idea was to have a piece that I could pose differently from one show to the next, a little bit like an instrument, like a violin. I'd play one sonata in one show, a different sonata in another. The pose would be a really big part of the work. The lighting and the pose would would bring forth whatever there was of an, of an illusion of emotional presence in the sculpture. And that's still really important, an important part of the work. So that even in the show here, even a head on a pedestal, the tilt of that head and its rotation is a kind of pose. So if a wonderful friend that I went to art school with, Richard Kizu Blair, had meanwhile become a director at Colossal Pictures, which was a little bit like an early version of Industrial Light and Magic, a special effects house in San Francisco. He's the one who turned me on to the Brothers Quay. And at one point, I told him that I had written the Quays to see if maybe we might collaborate or, you know, would they be interested in animating one of the pieces? And my friend Blair said, don't let the Quays animate it. Let us animate it. So some dead time came in the schedule, and I packed the sculpture up and flew out to San Francisco with it. And we had two weeks with a great 35 millimeter computer operated, beautiful movie camera, film camera. And um, I'll show you the, the animation that we did. OK, Kira, now I'm ready. Don't blink. This is really short.
fantastic. Thanks, Kira. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. It was really a fantastic two weeks to see how this was done. I really have to give credit where it's due on that animation. Um, Mike Belzer was the animator, and Mike is now the head of cell animation at Disney. This was, this was back in 1991. He was just starting, and he was a really consummate stop-frame animator. In fact, there was a little cadre of really great animators in the Bay Area through the 90s, and out of that group came many of the animators that, that work with Tim Burton on his films now. Um, I was really lucky to work with Mike, and we didn't have a script. Each day we'd all sit in the studio and argue about what we should have the figure do that day. A good day of work in film animation, even now, gets you maybe between five and 12 seconds of, of time of animation on film at 24 frames a second or, or, or less. And so then I would mime the action that we agreed on, and then Mike would work, and I'd sort of hover around and help him and fix things and tighten screws. And I did animate the eye myself, but Mike was the real, uh, the real master, and he's the one that really brought it to life. Um, and then my, my collaborator, Richard Kizu Blair, who endlessly made fun of me and teased me, also had a wonderful input in the into the choreography of, of that little piece. Um, we, we were looking for a soundtrack for it, and we were f listening to things that were in the sound library there and found a wonderful um, piece of music by Letitia Sanami, who turns out to be a, a f a, an extraordinary sound artist, and she gave us permission to use her soundtrack and her title, What Happened. And so the, f the film exists with a soundtrack, uh, a grand total of a minute and a half with a soundtrack, and then it also exists as a, um, as a silent. And it's the silent one that I really love. And I wondered what, what I could do with this film. At first, I, I showed it just on a little monitor like that with the piece nearby. And of course, everybody ran over and looked at the monitor and wanted to know how long it took to make it. And two weeks seemed kind of short compared to the three years it took to make the sculpture. And I thought, well, we're going to have to equal the contest here. You know, we're going to have to, we're going to have to, to figure out how we can. And then that became an incredible interest for me, how I could have the film live with the object and what might come about from having them be proximate to each other. So the first piece I tried was, um, one one great summer, I was fooling around with magnifying glasses and television monitors, and I noticed that if I put a magnifying glass in front of the television monitor, it I could make sort of a poor man's projector. So I, I made that frame there, and I put paper on it, and I edited a version of the video that was upside down since the lens inverted it, and I was projecting it just to get rid of the box, you know, the TV's behind the wall, it's coming through a hole in the wall, coming through a lens and, and um, showing on a piece of paper in the frame. But one day I took the paper down to try a different type of paper, and on my way back to the frame with a new paper, the image was there with no paper, but only in the optical axis of the lens. If you step to one side or the other, it would, disip it would eclipse out but if you stood right on the optical axis, and this doesn't photograph. In this picture, it looks like the image is behind the wall, but when you stand in front of it with your two eyes, with your binocular vision, it very compellingly appears to be in the plane of the frame. Um, and one of the pieces in the gallery here at Dartmouth is a similar piece where a video is projected through a lens out into space and seems to live and exist almost like a hologram in the space of an, a little empty frame in front of it. So that seemed like a fascinating discovery. And I, you know, at that point, I um, just made a piece that was nothing but an empty frame, a hole in the wall, and a lens over it. And I called it the sizes of things in the mind's eye and showed it in a couple of different places. It needs a darkened room. Um, with the right conditions, it, it's, it's very hologram-like. Um, though with the film that I had, the odd thing was is that the film had, was cropped. There was cuts, zooms, close-ups, and this, this, I needed a film more, that was more of a sculptural animation of a thing in the round 
for it to make sense hovering out in space. So I'm working on that now. That's been a, an ongoing project. Um, this is kind of, you know, this shows you the image sort of floating in the frame, but because it's cropped, I don't really get the maximum effect that I'm looking for. So that's an intriguing problem. Um, by this time, I had another piece, a newer piece, that was a work in progress. And that piece is the one that's here at Dartmouth in the show now. And I had a new animation of this piece and put them together in a vitrine. And again, the, the, the photo won't really show you what's there. But in the vitrine was the sculpture. And then its animation projected through a lens. The vitrine was pushed up against a wall. The television was hidden behind the wall. There was a hole with a lens. So its floating animation right over its shoulder materialized inside the vitrine with it. And I called that piece the sizes of things in the mind's eye. It's very inconvenient. There's now about six pieces all called the sizes of things in the mind's eye. And we can't ever get them straight. And now this show is called the sizes of things in the mind's eye. And I'm, I'm going to have to, here's a couple of, here I am working on the neck. The neck didn't work very well in that first animation. You know, it was a little choppy. So I started the next piece with the neck. By God, I was going to make a neck that would rotate and turn and torque smoothly. So this is part of the, the guts of the neck. And you'll see, you, you can't see this, but the piece that's in the gallery has these two ball and socket joints, one between the ears and then one right at the top of the, um, right behind the clavicle. Slung between them is a spring. So when those two joints move, the spring um, distributes the curve almost as if it was a jointed neck. And then arranged around that spring are the, the wooden slats, which I've, which I've cut there um, and will later carve into the outer shape of the neck. Here's a picture of it assembled, a black and white picture of it assembled. Now here's a shot of a couple of the pieces that are in the show in progress in my studio. Um, the white head that's lying on its side there was later finished. It's untitled. It's in the show. Um, the piece on the far left, your far, I guess your far right, is um, in the show. This is the one that has the neck built for it. And the one in the middle is a different piece, not in the show, a portrait of my mother. How do I make the pieces? Very traditionally, um, photographs, the mirror, sittings, but also life casts. I make lots and lots of casts from life and look at those as well. Um, there's nothing like looking at a three-dimensional object when you're sculpting a three-dimensional object. Photos are so flat and so misleading. So I have many, many life casts, different mouths, different eyebrows, nostrils flared and unflared heads that have been shaved. The reason these are, there's so many self-portraits in my work is that I'm available, I'm amenable, I'm willing, um, and it, it's a little invasive, you know? I mean, I, I, I have to say, it's a little bit invasive. And there is a kind of subcutaneous aspect to the work, and I'm just, I just don't want to do that to anybody else, but I feel comfortable doing it uh, with my own head and with my own body. This is a little piece called Some Kinds of Tissue. A close up. And then Bartlett's Hand, which is in the show. And this is the most recent animation and the most recent piece in which I've <laughs> tried to combine a sculpture and its animation. This one is, um, this one is a stop frame animation. Um, it's about 7,000 frames. We shot it with a digital camera rather than a film camera, but it's still stop frame, frame by frame, you know, maybe five, 10 seconds a day. And, and then sequenced into a film using one of the um, quick time codexes. So in the gallery, you'll see that the animation, it's, it's really high definition. I wanted to get as close to the sculpture as I could. So it's playing off of a computer. The computer's hidden in the pedestal. Um, and it delivers a, a wonderful um, resolution technically in terms of pixels higher than Blu-ray or a the HD um, versions that are just coming on the market now.
Here's a shot of a show a couple of years ago at Kent Gallery, a very dense sort of wonder cabinet of a show that had Earl making the glass eye there on the floor, and then next to it, the cabinet, a cabinet full of the glass eye collection, and then mannequins, and drawing of mannequins, and life casts, and sculptures, and, and animations. The old chair sculpture, we actually showed it. We dragged it out and showed it. And you can just see it in the other room there. Um, some of the photographs of, of pieces posed. This was the poster we made for the show. It took me about 30 hours to set this up. You know, get it, get everything all lined up. God, I had fun. You know, I just like took all the coolest things I could find in my studio and piled them into this cabinet and composed the photo. You know, I've got my Brooks Brothers suit ad. I've got, you know, I've got a beautiful pair of glass eyes I found in Rome up there in the middle, and then life casts and noses and mannequin hands and and oh, I love this picture. So remember to speak up or you won't know what you're thinking. And thank you very much for coming to this talk. Thank you.